Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Inner Products and Norms. In this video, we will focus on inner products. Let's quickly recall our standard notation. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. We also let V denote a vector space over F. To motivate the definition of the inner product, we'll start by looking at the dot product on Rn. In fact, we'll start by looking at this picture on R2. We have a vector with coordinates x1, x2, and the length of this vector is the square root of the sum of the squares of the coordinates. If we move from R2 to Rn, looking at a vector x equal x1 up to xn, then we define the norm of x to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the coefficients, as shown here. However, there is no linearity in sight. Thus, we introduce the dot product. Here's the definition. For vectors x and y in Rn, we define the dot product of x and y to be the sum of the coordinate-wise products, as shown here. We see immediately that x dot x equals the sum of the squares of the coordinates of x. Thus, x dot x is equal to the square of the norm of x. Now let's look at some easy properties of the dot product. If x is a vector in Rn, then x dot x is bigger than or equal to 0. We also see that x dot x is equal to 0 if and only if x is a 0 vector. Here's a crucial property. If we fix a vector y in Rn, then the map from Rn to R that sends x to x dot y is linear. In fact, this is the reason we introduced the dot product. We're bringing some linearity, which is always useful, back into the picture. And the final easy property, if x and y are vectors in Rn, then x dot y is equal to y dot x. In other words, the dot product is commutative. Note that the dot product of two vectors in Rn is a number. It's a real number. The four properties of the dot product on Rn, shown in the four bullet points here, are almost what we want to abstract to get to the notion of inner product. In fact, this works perfectly on real vector spaces, but for complex vector spaces, there's a little bit of a wrinkle that we need to consider first. Recall that if lambda is a complex number, then the absolute value of lambda is defined to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the real part of lambda and the imaginary part of lambda. The complex conjugate of lambda is defined by multiplying the imaginary part by negative 1. And we have the extremely useful identity that the absolute value of lambda squared is equal to lambda times the complex conjugate of lambda. For z a vector in Cn, we define the norm of z to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the coordinates. Note that we're squaring the absolute values of the coordinates, not just the coordinates themselves. This is because we want the norm to end up being a non-negative number. When we were working on Rn, we did not need to bother with absolute values when computing the norm because the square of any real number is a non-negative number. But here we really do need the absolute values. If we want to recover the relationship between the norm and the inner product, then we can no longer use our previous definition. The definition of norm in Cn suggests that our inner product of a vector w and z should be obtained by multiplying together the coordinates but taking the complex conjugate of the second vector and then adding up, as shown here. This provides our final motivation for the definition of an inner product. Please keep this in mind as we go to that definition now. We are now ready to give our definition of inner product. As usual, we will give a definition that works simultaneously regardless of whether the scalar field f is equal to the real numbers or whether it's equal to the complex numbers. Here we go. An inner product on our vector space V is a function 
that takes each ordered pair of elements u comma v in v to a number which we denote by u comma v with angle brackets around them that has the following properties. The first property is that the inner product of a vector with itself should be a non-negative number. By the way, when we use the greater than or equal to sign with a number that could conceivably be complex, we mean that the number is real and non-negative. Our second property is that the inner product of a vector with itself is equal to zero if and only if the vector is zero. Our third property is called additivity in the first slot. This means fix a vector w, it will go in the second slot, and then we have the additivity property shown by the equation here. The next property is called homogeneity in the first slot. Again, fix a vector in the second slot, and then we have the equation shown here, which indicates that if we have a scalar times a vector in the first slot, then we can bring the scalar outside. Our last property in the definition of an inner product is called conjugate symmetry. It says that if we interchange the order of the two vectors, we get the complex conjugate of what we started with. Recall that the complex conjugate of a real number is just the real number itself. Thus, in the case where our scalar field f is the field of real numbers, this property could be rewritten to say the inner product of u with v is equal to the inner product of v with u. In other words, when dealing with real numbers, the complex conjugate does nothing. However, it will matter when we are dealing with complex numbers. We leave it here so that we can have a single definition of inner product that works for both real and complex fields. Now let's look at some examples of inner products. For our first example, a vector, vector space will be Fn, and we have what is called the Euclidean inner product. As you can see, if f happens to be the scalar field of real numbers, this inner product agrees with the dot product that we had defined earlier. Here's another example, a generalization of the first one. Suppose we take positive numbers c1 up to cn, then we can define an inner product on fn as shown by the equation here. If all the c's are equal to 1, then we have the example from the first bullet point. For our next example, consider the real vector space consisting of the continuous real-valued functions on the interval from minus 1 to 1, and to find the inner product of two functions f and g to be their integral. You should pause the video for a moment to verify that this definition of inner product satisfies all four required properties for an inner product. For our final definition, we'll again look at a real vector space, this time the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients. We define the inner product of two such polynomials to be the integral from 0 to infinity of the product of the polynomials times the function e to the negative x. This integral converges and makes sense because e to the negative x goes to 0 much faster as x goes to infinity than any two polynomials can grow. The key point for all four of these examples is that an inner product is a function depending upon a vector space, and it gives us, for each two vectors in that vector space, a scalar. When we call something an inner product space, we mean that it is a vector space along with an inner product on it. Until further notice in these videos, we will let v denote an inner product space over f. By making this a standard assumption, we will not have to repeat in the hypothesis of each result that v is an inner product space. Now let's look at some properties of inner product spaces. Here's our first property. Suppose we fix a vector u in v. Then the function that takes a vector in v to that vector inner product with u is a linear map from v to f. This linearity follows from additivity in the first slot and homogeneity in the first slot. Our second property says that the inner product of 0 with any vector in v is 0. That follows immediately from linearity. Our third property says that the inner product of any vector with 0, now with 0 in the second slot, gives us 0. We obtain that result from the second bullet point 
by using the property that if we interchange the order of two vectors when taking an inner product, then we get the complex conjugate. And of course, the complex conjugate of zero is equal to zero. Our next property is called additivity in the second slot. This can be proved by using additivity in the first slot, along with the property that interchanging the order gives us the complex conjugate. And our last easy property states that if we have a scalar multiple of a vector in the second slot, then the scalar comes out multiplied by a complex conjugate. Again, this property follows from the definition using its properties that interchanging the order gives you the complex conjugate. Notice that in the case where a scalar field is real, this last bullet point says that u inner product lambda v is equal to lambda times u inner product v. In other words, we have linearity in the second slot only in the case where we have a real vector space. You should pause the video for a moment to make sure that you can verify all five of the bullet points listed here. This concludes part one of the video on inner products and norms.